Good morning. Um, as many of you have probably heard, uh, Orville Hodgkin went to be went home to be with his Lord and Savior Jesus Christ on Thursday, April 25th. Um, visitation will take place at Family's First Funeral Home on Lozon, just down the street here, uh, this afternoon from 2 to 4 p.m. and 6 to 8 p.m. Um, we'll also have a time of visitation here at Riverside um, tomorrow, Monday, April 29th from 10 to 10.45 a.m., and then the funeral will take place here at 11 a.m., and that'll be followed by a procession and a graveside service at Green Lawn Memorial Gardens. Uh, so please keep Pearl and the Hodgkin family in your prayers in this time. Let's just come to the Lord. We're going to pray for the Hodgkin family and others who have lost uh, loved ones in the last few years. Lord God, we, f- we praise you that you are great and awesome. You are all-powerful. You paint the skies in the morning and the evening. You uh, declare your glory in this vast creation, and yet you are also with us. You're so far above and beyond us, and yet you are also imminent. You are with your people in Jesus Christ. You are in your creation, working every moment of every day. You live in your people by your spirit, and we praise you for your presence with us. We praise you that you are a source of comfort. You are the source of comfort and compassion in times of brokenness and loss. Father, we thank you for the comfort that you've given so many of us in our times of loss and suffering in the last few years. I thank you that you are comforting um, and giving grace to Pearl and the Hodgkin family in, in Orville's passing. We pray that you'll continue to give them all the grace and wisdom and strength that they need and that you'll cover their hearts with your peace that passes understanding. Father, we pray that you will use us, Pearl's church family, to comfort her in this time with the comfort you have lavished on us in our times of loss. We pray for the time of visitation this afternoon and tomorrow morning. Um, That'll be an encouragement to Pearl and the family. Uh, We pray for the funeral tomorrow here at Riverside that'll be honoring to you, Lord God, that it would point people clearly to our one hope in life and death, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We pray that you be with all those who are going to... um, be reading scripture and sharing memories of Orville, Father. Give them wisdom as they write these things out and as they and strength to share them tomorrow. And we pray that you will just speak to our hearts through your word and speak peace and hope in in your son, Jesus Christ. Father, we pray for others who have lost family and loved ones in the past few years. We pray for uh, Magdalena's friends and our church family as she's gone home to be with you, Lord Jesus. We pray for Ro- Rosemary Chapman and her family as you took Gary home um, last year. We also pray for many others, Father, for Agatha Morgan's family, for, um, um, for Fred Coop's family, for Father, for Emily and the family there as you took Fred home. We pray for the Nicholson family as you took Jack home and for Percy Jones' family as you took him home. Father, there's so many others who have lost loved ones these last few years, or even in the last decade or so. Father, you know that Sorrow and mourning doesn't, doesn't just go away in a few months or even a few years. There are those times with birthdays, anniversaries, holidays, when we look at the table with the family and there's a spot empty, and that burdens our hearts. And so we just pray for grace and comfort and peace for all who have lost loved ones. We praise you for all who are trusting in Christ, Lord Jesus. You've taken them home. And so they're rejoicing with you, Father. You know that it's especially difficult when we lose loved ones who are not believers in Jesus. And that brings extra sorrow to our hearts. And so we pray for extra grace for those who have lost loved ones who were not in Christ. Father, we pray that you continually turn our hearts to you, to trust you, to love you, to find great joy in serving you and living for you even as our hearts break. You're a loving, compassionate Father. And the death of your children in Christ is precious in your sight. Father, we pray for others in our church who are suffering uh, with physical pain, emotional um, heartache and pain, Father, mental struggles, mental health challenges. We pray for grace upon grace for them each day. Father, we pray that you bless all those who helped uh, with the move yesterday and be with Rebecca as she adjusts to her new uh, living situation. Just, we pray that you cover that situation with your hand and your grace in this time. Um, We praise you that we can call you Father, because, you're, because of your son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, 
Uh, May we walk faithfully with you today. We pray that every aspect of this service would be honoring to you. Father, we pray that we would have continued (laughs) electricity so we could have microphones that work and be able to record the service and post it later for those who watch online. Uh, May we honor and glorify you, Lord God, with all that is said and done. Uh, May the words of our mouths and meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer, let me pray now that as we collect the offering that we will give generously and cheerfully and that you will use this money to build your kingdom and bring glory and honor and praise to your great name. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. is your chance to join in so if you're able to stand please stand but also sing if you're sitting Um, we're going to sing the Lord is my salvation Strong. 
I have to tell my joke. Sorry. <laughs> I was going to start the service by saying that uh, some of the band is on tour. That's why they're not with us today. But anyways, I digress. <laughs> Before we sing our next song, um, I'm going to read some verses from Colossians 3. And so I'm assuming most of you um, decided maybe yesterday or this morning what you were going to wear. But God wants us to be clothed with um, other things. So here we go. Colossians 3, 12 to 14. Verse 12. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. seated. We're going to dismiss the children to their children's Bible lesson time upstairs. We're going to ask God to bless our time in his word this morning. So let's pray. Lord God, we praise you that your word shows us your son, Jesus Christ. We pray that we would see him, that we would not just hear words that sound nice. We would not just feel conviction. We would see Jesus our Lord and Savior, the one who is our example in all things, and the life that you have called us to live in your Son, Jesus Christ, speak to our hearts. Give us ears to hear, hearts that accept your truth, the power from your Spirit to obey it, and to live like Jesus Christ, our Savior, and honor you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Do you ever play the favorites game with your family or friends? You kind of Maybe it's like Easter, Christmas, family gathering, and you kind of want to get some conversation going, and you say, okay, what's your favorite dessert? 
And then people go, ooh. <laughs> carrot cake. We have this homemade carrot cake we make. You pick up the pan after it's made. It weighs about 10 pounds. I'm not even kidding. It's so good. Uh, Mississippi mud. You ever had that? Ooh. Nanaimo bars. I like desserts. Anyways, what's your favorite dessert? What's your favorite sports team? And all of a sudden, you get two people that like arch rivals, and they're like going head to head on it. it it opens people up. It gets people talking about things. It's, it's, it's good. It's fun to have favorite things in this world. But when it comes to playing favorites with people, that's different, isn't it? You remember in grade school, you line up along the wall. They don't do this anymore, and I think they do it for a reason. You put everyone on the wall, and okay, we're going to play dodgeball or baseball or volleyball, and you have two captains who are the best athletes, and they pick first, one back and forth. Kids, you don't, you don't have to go through this anymore, so good for you. So you're there and you're like, please don't pick me last. Please don't pick me last. And so they pick the best athletes one after the other and they start picking their friends. And then there's like others. And then there's like three or four kids left and they're kind of sitting there twiddling their thumbs going, please pick me. And so the captain's kind of looking at each other. Like, I don't really want them, but you know, I'll take him. You take their, you know, and then so they're, that's it. They're, everyone's divvied up. What ends up happening is those last few feel really awkward and unwanted and hurt. Maybe you were one of those people. Maybe you weren't athletic. Maybe you weren't good at sports. And so you're like, I know I'm going last. And it, it's, it's hurtful. There have been times in all of our lives when there was a party or a gathering and many people were invited, but we weren't. Whether it was on purpose or maybe you just got forgotten. Again, that left us feeling unwanted, unworthy. That's what happens when people play favorites with one another. And as we look at the Bible, we see favorites, especially in the Old Testament. So Jacob was Rebecca's. So you, Rebecca and Isaac have two children, and Rebecca loves Jacob more. Why? Maybe because he was hanging out with her in the tents all the time, making food. We don't know exactly. Esau hunted, and his dad Isaac loved his stew, and so Esau was Isaac's favorite. And that worked out really well, didn't it? No, they... Jacob stole his brother's birthright and his blessing. Esau wanted to kill his brother. Finally, late, years later, they were brought back together and, and Esau forgave him. But this favoritism led to really bad things. And it's generational because then Jacob has a, two wives, never a good situation. And he, he loves his wife, Rachel, more. And therefore, he loves Joseph and Benjamin. Of all his 12 sons, he loves them the most. And how did that turn out? Joseph, I love you so much. Here's this special coat. And his brothers hate him. And they throw him in a pit and sell him into slavery in Egypt. Now, God turned it all around to save his people. But this is terrible. Playing favorites with people is never a good thing. Not in school, not in our workplaces, not in the church. James addresses this issue in our passage today. He tells us don't play favorites with people. And he tells us why we shouldn't do this. So please turn in your Bibles to James 2, verses 1 to 13. It's where we are as we're looking through the book of James. James 2, 1 to 13. And may God speak to our hearts through his powerful and practical word. James 2, 1 to 13. My brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes and a poor man in filthy old clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you. But say to the poor man, you stand there or sit on the floor by my feet. Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my dear brothers and sisters, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith? And to inherit the kingdom he promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are blaspheming the noble name of him of whom you belong? If you really keep the royal law found in scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said you shall not commit adultery also said you shall not murder. If you do not commit adultery but do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. 
speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. Because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Now, we've seen several times that James is very direct. He doesn't kind of beat around the bush. He goes straight to the point. He says in verse 1, believers in our Lord, glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favoritism. He doesn't say it's not nice to play favorites, so you really shouldn't do it. He doesn't say we really shouldn't play favorites. James flat out tells us we must not show favoritism. There is to be no favoritism in the church. And we need this instruction because we all struggle with this at times, don't we? It's easy for us to be around people who look and talk and act like us. It's easy to talk to other Christians who don't swear or use foul language. It's easier to have conversations. You grew up in Canada and understand the culture and speak English well. It's easier for us to connect with people who are like us in so many different ways. And it's difficult to connect with people who are unlike us, who look and talk and think and act in very different ways. James knew this was an issue among the Jewish believers that he was addressing this book to, and the Holy Spirit knows that this is an issue among believers in Christ in our lives today. So James starts off by telling us the truth about favoritism. Playing favorites is sinfully discriminating against and judging people. Playing favorites is sinfully discriminating against and judging people. It's wrong. It's evil. It's sin. James 2, 1 to 4, My brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, must not show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in filthy old clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man or woman, wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you. But say to the poor man, you stand there or you sit on the floor by my feet. Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? James is really sneaky. He's not just making commands or making statements. He's asking questions. Why do you ask questions? So the person is forced to answer the question. If I treat someone like this, Am I discriminating and judging with evil thoughts? And the answer awkwardly is yes. And he asks a number of rhetorical questions where the answer is obvious, but he makes us answer it in our own hearts and our own lives. We've all heard the Bible verse, judge not lest you be judged. Judging is more than just pointing out someone's sinful behavior. Judging is an attitude in our hearts that causes us to think certain people deserve less respect and grace because of how they look or talk because of their appearance. So we look at the outward appearance and we judge people based on what they look or talk or act like. But God looks much deeper than we do. He considers who people really are. 1 Samuel 16, 7. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height. For I've rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Israel's first king, Saul, they wanted the biggest, strongest guy. So God gave them the biggest, strongest guy. He was the tallest from the shoulder up in Israel by like six or eight inches. He's a big, burly man and filled with fear and and wanted approval from everyone. That doesn't work in a leader, does it? A fearful leader who wants approval from everyone will never make any decisions, will always doubt and follow people instead of God. That didn't work. And so God said to Samuel, I'm going to pick the next king. I'm picking him. David's my king, the shepherd boy who's freckled and tanned and and he was kind of handsome, but he was the youngest. You don't pick the youngest of however many brothers he had. You pick the oldest, strongest, burliest. No, not God. God looks at the heart. James tells us that in the church there was judging and discrimination between the rich and the poor, treating a rich person with more dignity and respect than a poor person. So the rich person comes in dressed in just beautiful clothing. They got rings on their fingers and they're shown respect and honor. You sit over here. We're going to give you special attention. But the poor man dressed in rags is told to stand off to the side to sit on the floor because the chairs are reserved for more respectful people. How insulting, how degrading, how terrible is that? 
Can you imagine someone comes in, you say, you know what? That pew is reserved for more respectable people. You sit on the floor over here. That's terrible. Now, do you remember what James said about pure and faultless religion in God's eyes? James 1.27, listen to this. Religion that God our Father accepts is pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows and the distress. So a poor widow walks into the church wearing rags. An orphan comes in looking for help. And the church says, I'm sorry, you're not respectable enough for our love and our respect and our help. That's not honoring to God. And so James had just told them, this is what God sees as pure and holy behavior, is to take care of the poorest. And yet the church is doing the opposite. They're showing respect for the rich and showing disrespect to the poor. We are commanded to love and care for the poor. And we would like to think that we don't judge or discriminate between the rich and the poor today, but the reality is we can still struggle with this because of our sinful hearts. If someone comes to our church nicely dressed in a suit, seems very dignified, we might treat them with more respect than someone who comes in wearing torn clothes or a t-shirt with something offensive on it. Would we treat a homeless person who came in that was unwashed and dressed in rags the same? Would we treat our neighbor who was well put together and well dressed? If someone is smoking a cigarette or taking a swig out of a beer can outside and they come into the church, do we treat them the same way as someone who walks in with a Tim Hortons mug and is drinking from that? The reality is that judging others is something we all struggle with. We don't see through people's exterior the same way that God does. We don't see their hearts. We don't naturally see the rich or poor as someone who needs Jesus to save them from their sins and transform them to his holy image, no matter who they are, how they behave, how they dress, how they or talk or act. James tells us that favoritism that flows from judging other people is sin, is sin. And so we need this instruction from James in this passage. And he moves on in verses 5 to 7 to tell us why we shouldn't play favorites between the rich and the poor why we shouldn't play favorites. Now, as we go through this book, you'll notice many similarities between James' teaching and our Lord Jesus' teaching throughout his earthly ministry, and especially in his Sermon on the Mount. It starts off in chapter 5, Matthew 5, by speaking about those who are blessed in God's kingdom. James follows his Lord Jesus' example, uses the word blessed a number of times in this book. James 1.12 says, Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial. Because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. We saw last week the importance of hearing and obeying God's word and how God responds to our obedience. James 1.25, But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. So these are kind of like James Beatitudes hopping off of Jesus' teaching. We see in our passage this morning that James once again refers to Jesus' words about who is blessed in the Sermon on the Mount. And James does this to show us the first reason why we should not play favorites with the rich over the poor. James 2, 5, and 6. Listen, my dear brothers and sisters. Has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor. God has chosen poor people to be blessed, to be part of his kingdom. Now listen to what Jesus says in Matthew 5, 3, the very first verse of the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It's almost word for word. And Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit. Those who recognize I'm spiritually bankrupt, I'm a sinner, and I'm lost, and I'm, I deserve death and judgment for my sins, but I'm trusting in Jesus Christ alone for my salvation. Those who acknowledge their brokenness and sin and their need for Jesus and place their faith in Christ alone are blessed by God with forgiveness and eternal life as part of his kingdom. James 2.5 shows us how God has chosen those who were poor financially in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and be part of his kingdom. Now, we need to understand that being poor financially doesn't mean automatic salvation in Christ and be part of his kingdom. That's not the way it works. 
We must trust in Jesus Christ alone for our salvation. That's the only way to be right with God and be part of his kingdom. But the reality in James' time and throughout church history is that many poor people, many financially poor people have come to faith in Jesus Christ and been added to God's kingdom. Why? Because the poor don't have earthly wealth to depend on them, to depend on or to distract them from God. The poor are naturally dependent and humble. And so when they hear the gospel and the riches of God's grace and love and forgiveness and the kingdom they can be part of, they grab a hold of it in love and humility and faith. They trust in Christ and they get saved. The rich often don't. Why? Because I have my money. I have my stuff. I'll figure it out. I'll work through things. I'll buy my way out of this problem. The rich depend on their their money, the poor don't have money to depend on. So many of them turn to faith in Christ and are saved and become rich and part of his eternal kingdom. And so we see the first reason not to play favorites between the rich over the poor. God chose to bless the poor with faith in Jesus and inheritance into his kingdom. God chose to bless the poor with faith in Jesus and inheritance into his kingdom. And so some of these people Poor people who are being mistreated by the church, as James is writing to, are actually brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. So a poor poor, poor person comes in, and the first question is not, where are you with Christ? Are you a believer in Jesus Christ? The first question people are asking is, are they respectable enough to sit in the chair? Are they good-looking enough to be part of our church? Are they worthy of respect and honor? That's, those are terrible questions. Those are judging questions. It's not our responsibility. If they came in and they find out this person's believer in Christ, praise God, doesn't matter if they're dressed in rags or robes, they're brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. And so why should the church treat their poor brothers and sisters so badly, treating them as unworthy of respect or honor when God, their father, had blessed them spiritually, forgiven their sins, and made them part of his kingdom. Instead of treating these poor believers as second-class citizens, unworthy of respect or honor, the church should treat them as they truly were, as fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. God continues to draw many financially poor people to faith in Jesus today. And so when someone walks into our church building here at Riverside, When we come across someone as we're out shopping around town, maybe we're downtown Windsor, downtown other large cities. When you're walking around downtown in large cities, what do you inevitably come across? Who do you inevitably come across? You come across the homeless. Why? Because that's where the people are that can help them. And so we're walking around, and I'm guilty of this, and you see a homeless person, what do you do? You turn, put the blinders on, and you walk right past them. Now, I'm not saying it's easy to know how to help a homeless person. Giving money isn't always the best option. Food, there's only one thing you can do with food. Well, two things. You can eat it or throw it away, (laughs) right? We can help. It's just how to help is the question. And so when we see people, let's not judge them based on their clothing, their appearance, or their homelessness. Let's not treat people with less respect because they don't have a nice car, nice clothes, because they're not as hygienically well cared for as we are. Let's instead pray and ask the Spirit to show us where this person stands with Jesus. And even before that, Lord, this is a person made in your image. Every person is made in your image and deserving of love and honor and respect. And every person needs Jesus. And so let's pray. Is this person trusting in Christ to take away their sins? Are they part of your eternal kingdom? Or are they still lost in their sins and they need to hear the gospel and need to come to faith in Christ? If they're a believer, let's welcome them with love and kindness and respect. And if they're not, let's show the same, but also seek to show the love of Christ, to share the gospel with them so they can be saved. Let's keep reading to see another practical reason not to play favorites between the rich and the poor. The end of verse six and verse seven, is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Again, the rhetorical questions. Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are blaspheming the noble name of him to whom you belong? And the answer to all three of these questions is yes, 
Yes, yes. And so the rich were sinning against the church and their Savior Jesus. Why would believers in Christ show favoritism to the rich when they were sinning against the church and against their Savior Jesus Christ? James asks three rhetorical questions to show the three things, the three sins that the rich were committing against the church and against their Lord Jesus. First, the rich oppressed believers. The rich were oppressing believers. The Greek word translated as exploited means to exercise harsh control over, to use one's power against, to oppress. The rich in James' time were using their power and authority to push down, to oppress these believers. We don't know exactly what that looked like, but God's people throughout the history of the church have faced persecution from the rich and powerful throughout the history of the church. And so why would these believers favor the rich over the poor? It didn't make any logical sense. Secondly, James asks the second question and tells us that the rich dragged believers into court. The rich were dragging believers into court. Lawsuits were fairly common in James' time in the Roman Empire. You could sue for pretty much any reason about anything. Sound familiar? This coffee's too hot. Do you know why it says hot, caution hot, on the McDonald's coffee cup? The important coffee cup? You know why? Because someone got one, spilled it, or drank it, burned themselves, and says, I'm suing you. Isn't coffee supposed to be hot? <laughs> That's the kind of society we live in. You can sue over anything at any time. Now, it doesn't mean you win, but if you have to go to court, that's expensive. These poor believers couldn't afford this. This is an inconvenience and possibly very costly. And so why would believers in Christ favor rich people who are dragging them into court? The third sin is the worst. The rich blaspheme the holy name of Jesus Christ, the Savior and Lord of the church. They were blaspheming the holy name of the noble one to whom they belong. That's Jesus. These rich people, they might have been believers in Christ. We'd, maybe people in the church or maybe outside, they were bringing a bad name to the noble name of our Savior Jesus. Maybe they did this through their blasphemous and mocking words. Maybe they did it by treating Jesus with contempt by their actions and treatment of his disciples. And so why would believers in Jesus Christ favor rich people who sin against them and blaspheme their Savior and Lord? And the obvious answer is neither they nor we should ever favor the rich over the poor. That doesn't mean we treat them worse. You can look at that and say, well, they deserve worse treatment than the poor. Mm -mm. Again, love your neighbor as yourself. Who's my neighbor? Every single person I come in contact with. Good Samaritan. Doesn't matter if they're Jew or Gentile, slave or free. Doesn't matter. They're our neighbor if we come in contact with them, whether in person or online. James goes on to tell us in verses 8 to 13 about that favoritism breaks the law of love. Favoritism breaks the law of love. Verses, look at verses 8 and 9. If you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbors yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as law breakers. Remember that conversation? I think it was a teacher of the law or a lawyer came to Jesus trying to stump him. Jesus, which is the most important command <laughs> out of the 10 or the 200, however many it is, which is the most important one? Well, you can't stump God because he knows everything. He wrote the law. Matthew twenty two thirty seven 37 to 40, Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself on the law. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. James calls the command of God the royal law, the law given to us by the king of kings and lord of lords. And this law is all about love for God and other people. And if we keep and obey this law, we are doing right in God's holy eyes. As, we, as followers of Christ, we are called to love other people as we love ourselves, treating them with as much or more respect and dignity and kindness than we expect others to give us. But if we show favoritism, treating the rich better than the poor, showing more respect to one person than another, we are not showing others the love we are commanded to by our holy God. We are sinning and breaking his law of love. And so we see that favoritism is the opposite of loving our neighbor. 
And so we break God's law. Favoritism is the opposite of loving our neighbor. This is not a harmless thing in God's eyes. It's sin. It's evil. It makes us lawbreakers and rebels against our holy and loving God. And James continues to impress upon us the seriousness of favoritism in verses 10 to 11. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said you shall not commit adultery also said you shall not murder. If you do not commit adultery but do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. And these verses remind me of the rich young man who came to Jesus. He says, Lord, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Is that a loaded question or what? And Jesus says, well, you know what the law says. And he doesn't quote the first four commands. He quotes the second six about loving your neighbor as yourself. And this young man being, I don't know if he's just ignorant or just deceiving himself, says, oh, I've kept all those since I was a kid. Really? You obeyed your parent every single time they said, clean up your room. You did it instantly without grumbling or complaining or whining. Honor your father and mother. You never wanted what someone else had, ever. You never lied. You never bore false witness against another person. This man is deceiving himself. But even if he did somehow keep all of the laws about loving his neighbor, Jesus tells him he's still missing something crucial. Luke 18, 22 and 23. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, you still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. When he heard this, he became very sad because he was very wealthy. Jesus knew this man had not kept the very first command of loving and worshiping God alone. Exodus 20 verses 2 and 3. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. This man's wealth is his God. If it wasn't, then he would say, absolutely, here's everything. I don't want it. I want you, Jesus. Jesus demanded that because he knew he wouldn't give it up. He exposed his idolatry, his worship of other gods. And by breaking this one law, this man was guilty of breaking all of God's law. James tells us the same thing about those who show favoritism of the rich over the poor. If we stumble in judging and disrespecting the poor, we have broken God's law and are guilty of breaking not just one or two commands, but the whole of God's law. And so we see when we break one part of the law, we are guilty of breaking all of it. Now that leads us to a place where I am broken and lost in my sins and I need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. The law has exposed me as a lawbreaker. How many of us have judged other people sinfully? I have. If your hand's not up, you're lying, okay? <laughs> we are all lawbreakers. We have broken God's law. We are sinners who have fallen short of God's standard of perfection, obeying all of his commands. And the wages of sin is death. When we sin, we earn separation from God in this life and then we die, our soul leaves our body and we're cut off from God forever under his judgment in hell. Forever and ever and ever. I praise God, that's not the end of the story. God looks at us in our sinful judging in all of our sinfulness and says, I know how messed up and broken you are, but I choose to love you. And I'm not just gonna say it, I'm gonna prove it. And God proved it by sending his own son Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God gave us his own son, Jesus, to come to earth. And notice who Jesus interacted with. He interacted with everyone. The tax collectors, super rich. The people that had nothing, lepers. He showed love to lepers who have nothing, not even health. Jesus showed love and kindness and respect. He spoke truth, sometimes hard truths, to those who were rich and powerful to humble them and show them their need of salvation. Jesus didn't show favoritism. He didn't judge. He judged based on the heart because he's God. Jesus lived a perfect life. He went to the cross. He took my sin, our sin, and guilt and shame. He paid for it in full. He took all of our judgment and punishment. He said, it is finished. He died. He rose again from the dead. And Jesus now offers us what we cannot earn for ourselves, forgiveness for all of our sins, all of our judging and favoritism and all the other sins we commit. 
He offers us forgiveness, but more than that, he offers us a new life where we live differently as new creations. We don't live playing favorites anymore. But now we live and we say, Lord, show me this person, who this person is, where they're at, and help me to love them no matter who they are and point them to you. God offers us a new life to love and serve and worship him and love others with his love. And we receive that forgiveness and new life by turning from sin. You can't live in this world loving what it loves and living rejecting Jesus Christ and be forgiven. You need to turn Take your faith off this world. Stop rejecting Jesus. Run to Jesus and trust in him alone to wash away your sins. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Turn from sin, trust in Jesus Christ, and you will be saved right now. You could start living a new life that honors God in every way because his spirit comes to live in your heart If you are a child of God through faith in Jesus, you don't have to show favoritism anymore. Sin has no power over us. It only has the power we give to it because the Holy Spirit of God is infinitely powerful, more powerful than any temptation we could ever face. And so James continues to speak to believers in Christ in this passage. He calls us to a higher and holier behavior than favoritism. James 2, verses 12 and 13. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. Because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. James refers to the law as one that gives freedom. He used those same words in James 1.25. But whoever looks intently to the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. There's the beatitude again. Blessed by looking into the law that gives freedom. God's law, it does seem restrictive at times, doesn't it? But it actually brings freedom to our lives. As we follow God's holy law of love by the power of his spirit, we avoid guilt and shame and punishment. We live freely apart from so many consequences of sin. As we live according to God's word, we live in the freedom that God created us for, a life filled with his blessing and his peace and his joy. That's true freedom, living for Jesus, our Savior and Lord, with purpose and peace. God's word is like a mirror. It judges and reveals to us who we really are. We need that because we're really good at deceiving ourselves sometimes, aren't we? You read the passage, and you're like, I've never done that before. Just sit there for a bit. <laughs> Lord, have I done this? And Wait. Maybe go for a walk and pray and come back and go, oh man, I've done this a lot. I'm I'm guilty of this. The word of God's word, God's word that brings freedom will also judge, it will reveal who we are and what we really believe. And so James shows us two ways in verses 12 and 13 that we can respond to God's law of love and what it reveals about our hearts and our relationship with Jesus. He tells us in verse 12 that genuine believers in Christ speak and act mercifully towards the poor and needy and obedience to God's law. Genuine believers in Christ speak and act mercifully toward the poor and the needy in obedience to God's law. The theme of James is faith that works. If Jesus really is our Savior and Lord, if he saved us from our sins and made us new creations, then our faith in him will result in a radically new and holy life. Not perfect yet, but new and holy. Our faith in Jesus will drive us to show mercy and love to the poor and needy, to meet the needs of the widow and the orphan and the refugee. Our faith in Jesus will keep us from having hard hearts towards those who are different from us will keep us from playing favorites and judging them and will produce acts of mercy and love and charity in our lives. That's how genuine believers in Christ live and that's pure and God-honoring religious action. As James says, can I go back to my verses? Speak and act as those who are going to be judged The word judges us, and so may, when we look at the word of God, may our lives by the power of the Holy Spirit reveal, yes, I trust in Jesus. He is my Savior here, and the evidence is the mercy and compassion 
and love. That's evidence that I look like Christ, that I'm saved. And James also shows us the flip side of this. When you look at the word of God, judging and showing favoritism, you can put in brackets, consistently, refusing to show mercy reveals a heart that is under God's judgment and needs to be saved. Now, that's not saying that we do these things once, that we're automatically lost in our sins again. Because when you trust in Christ and you're saved, the Spirit continues to sanctify you, to make you holy. We will all sin, even as believers in Christ. Why? Because we still have a sin nature. But if the consistent pattern of our lives is sin, 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 constantly over and over, there's no change, there's no evidence of salvation, then we are under God's judgment. We need to be saved. Verse 13, because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. It's easy for us to say, I am trusting in Jesus Christ. I prayed a prayer when I was five. I asked Jesus into my heart when I was seven. Yes, but what does your life say now? If someone acts like they don't know or love Jesus, they don't love other people, they don't show mercy to the poor and needy, if they show favoritism to the rich and ignore or treat the poor without mercy, this reveals a heart that is not saved. It needs to be transformed by the power of God. Continual sin reveals a heart that is under God's judgment, needs salvation. But praise God for the last four words of this passage. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Whose mercy? God's mercy. Starting with God and then flows through us. Okay? If you realize I am lost, I'm characterized by sin, I'm under God's judgment, God's mercy in Jesus Christ, his forgiveness in Jesus Christ is greater than the judgment you deserve. And so again, the gospel comes into play. If, I feel, if you can feel convicted of sin as an unbeliever, as someone under God's judgment needing salvation, run to Jesus in faith and trust in him alone to save you, and you will experience God's saving mercy and grace. And as we look at other people, mercy, God's mercy in and through us trumps our judgment of them. We used to look at people in judgment. We don't look at that, them that way anymore. We look at them with mercy and compassion. This poor person, yes, they're filthy and they're wearing rags. They need help. They need love. They need compassion. They need food. They need water. They need, do they need Jesus? Let's find that out, right? Let's give them the food and the water that they need and, and, and find out who they are and their story. Maybe we'll find they are a believer and praise God. You're my brother or sister of Christ. If not, you need Jesus, Mercy, God's mercy triumphs, triumphs over the judgment we deserve. And as God works in our hearts, we will show mercy that triumphs over the judgment we used to show. We will be merciful children of God by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, James is convicting, isn't it? You read this and go, ugh. God's word is a sword that cuts right through your heart. And sometimes it feels like he's kind of twisting it around a little bit, doesn't he? <laughs> like, I'm, I'm feeling convicted of judging and favoritism and, and discrimination. And that's wrong and sinful. And what can happen, what the devil wants us to do is kind of slink away from God saying, oh man, I'm terrible. And you kind of slink off into the corner and to put your tail between your legs and you walk away from God. Don't do that. Conviction is not meant to push us away from God. It's meant to have us run to God. Because God wants to forgive. God wants to transform. God wants to make us merciful and compassionate and loving. But that starts with acknowledging. Don't run from this. Holy Spirit, I acknowledge you're convicting me of this sin. I've done this. First John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. All, isn't that great? All unrighteousness. Circle that one in First John 1, 9. There aren't certain sins that God goes, well, these are unforgivable. The only sin God doesn't forgive is the sin of rejecting Christ as Savior. God can't forgive you if you reject his son, the only way of salvation. But if you're in Christ as his child, then when you're convicted of any sin in Scripture, the response should be, Father, you know this hurts my heart to see this in me. It's wrong, it's sinful, please forgive me. And not just forgive me, repentance. Give me the power and the strength and the wisdom to turn away from this behavior. I don't want to do this anymore. 
but I acknowledge in my own I will keep doing it because I'm not strong enough to overcome it, but you are. And so please give me your power and your strength and your wisdom so when someone comes along, I don't look at their outward appearance. I care about this person as as created in God's image, made by you for your glory, to live as your child to faith in Christ. Help me to love people with your love. Show them your mercy and compassion and kindness So please fill my heart with your grace and your mercy and your compassion. So when I see people, I see them as you see them and I reflect your character to them and people see Christ in me, my hope of glory. Please give me opportunities to share the gospel with this person or to rejoice with them in their salvation if they are a believer in Christ. And so let's not turn away from this in conviction feeling terrible. Let's instead run to the Lord for forgiveness because he has already paid for our sins on the cross. Jesus paid for our sin and he offers forgiveness and he wants to transform us and make us people who do not judge and discriminate and show favoritism, but who show grace and mercy and compassion by his power and for his glory. Because that's what Jesus did. Let's pray. Lord God, we acknowledge that this passage does convict us. This book is convicting. Um, But we praise you that it doesn't leave us without hope. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Your mercy, Father, you've lavished mercy on us in your son, Jesus. You You are willing to forgive our sins. You've given us, graciously given us your son so we can be forgiven, we can be saved, we can be transformed. We are new creations in Christ. I pray that if anyone here is feeling conviction and acknowledging, I, I don't know Jesus. He's not my Savior. He's not my Lord. I'm a sinner. I need salvation. Father, I pray that you give them repentance to turn from their sins and faith to trust in your Son, Jesus, to save them and make them new creations. And Father, for those of us who are trusting in Christ, as you convict us of any sin, please turn our hearts to you in humility and confession for forgiveness. And that you would renew our minds. You would transform our hearts. You would give us the power and the strength to overcome any sin and walk in holiness and mercy and grace and love and compassion like Jesus our Savior. May we honor you with the way we respond to your word this morning. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand with us to sing. Yeah. Mm-hmm.
invite you to stay for our discussion group times. We meet in small groups where we take the sermon outline questions on the back of that and discuss what it means for us today, how it applies to our lives, what we just heard from God's word. So do please pray, or stay. <laughs> in about 15 minutes, we will gather for, in those small groups uh, in the library, the small group room off the foyer in the church basement. And let's just close with a benediction. Oh, and if you are interested um, if you have served in, in a leadership role in the past from the community picnic, if you led maybe the welcome table, the food area, the kitchen, um, please, if you would like to be involved in leadership again, please join me for that meeting up in my office in about 15 minutes as well. Let's just close with a benediction. May the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else, just as ours does for you. May he strengthen your hearts so that you'll be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father, when our Lord Jesus comes with all his holy ones. And God's people said, Amen.